Hello, my name is Felix Gruden. I'm a PhD trained immunologist and biological uh, researcher at UC Irvine. Um, and I'm going to be talking today for Costa Mesa Brief about the current coronavirus outbreak. So I should start off by saying that the information I'm talking about today is public information and represents my opinions and interpretation of the data that's out there. So very quickly, just to um, keep you orientated, um, one of the troubling um, factors about the coronavirus uh, outbreak is that it has a very high rate of infection. So that's represented by this R0 value here. An R0 value between about two and three represents um, outbreaks that are difficult to control and include rapid community spread. Now, the important factor is the reinfection time. That's how long after somebody is infected before they can infect a new person. And indications are that it's, although it's uncertain at the moment, it can happen quite quickly, probably within a day or two. During that time, the first couple of days, the viral amount in a person increases very rapidly to maybe about a million copies per mL in the respiratory droplets from the lungs, and as high as about 7 times 10 to the 8, about 700 billion copies per mL. So at this point, somebody is very infectious. The incubation time is also relatively uh, long before a person shows symptoms, typically about four days. So that means that there are people who may be asymptomatic but highly infectious in the community. Another important fact is the mortality rate. So the mortality rate um, for many respiratory diseases, uh, like the flu, is around about 0.1%, with the coronavirus current estimates in diagnosed individuals is about 2 to 3%, but this number may be lower if you include the undiagnosed pool of patients in that number. Uh, one of the things that is important is that uh, the risk of serious illness and death increases with comorbidities, and those risk factors include smoking, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and being immunocompromised. As a consequence, we've seen a very rapid rise throughout the world and in the U.S. of cases, almost an exponential increase, which will continue for the foreseeable future. In fact, one of the worrying um, issues here is because of a um, the types of values that we see with the uh, infection rate and the ability to spread undetected, we can expect a very high peak or surge peak in infections in the coming months or maybe even longer. Uh, this is a very simple uh, simulation here that was published in a recent article in the New York Times. It's just a very simplistic model just to give you an, an overall idea. Um, research grade models are much more sophisticated and may in fact give different answers. But nevertheless, in this model, uh, would predict that maybe up to 30% of a population will become infected over the next years. With next year, with a peak population uh, infection rate here, maybe some point in the summer. As a consequence, we can also expect a significant stress on the medical system, and that leads to uh, increased number of deaths. If we intervene early here through social distancing, the idea is to flatten the curve, is reduce the populations, and reduce the overall death rate. Nevertheless, even in a city like Costa Mesa with 100,000 or more um, citizens, if you have 30% infection over the next year or so, that's very significant and would in potentially include a large number of deaths. So one of the ways that um, uh, different countries have implemented testing to try to monitor the outbreak and try to uh, set public health policies um, is represented here. For instance, for Chinese and Koreans, have a way of looking at um, uh, individuals in the public space uh, with random tests at high, f at, uh, high throughput places such as uh, train stations, bus stops, shopping centers, or through drive through stops, where they monitor people for, for fever. If those are positive, they're sent to a local health clinic where they conduct additional tests. They can rule out certain diseases like the flu and bacterial infections very quickly and then triage people if they need further testing, and if they test positive for COVID-19, then they can be directed to a quarantine center for care and treatment. In contrast, in the United States here, we have a slightly different problem because of the uh, slow rate in testing. Uh, at the moment, only patients that are symptomatic or at high risk have, have travel or known contacts with positive patients are tested. Testing takes between one and four days before answers come back and then patients are quarantined within hospitals. Uh, we're not testing families and close contacts routinely, we're not testing medical staff, we're not testing first responders, and we're not testing the public in general for surveillance 
uh, to monitor the, the spread of the, uh, of the virus in the community. So we're basically flying blind as a consequence. That's the reason why social distancing is so important. And if you're sick, home isolation is, is also critical. But it's not the ideal situation. What we really want is we want to be able to um, direct positive patients to residential care centers or in a quarantine so that we don't continue to infect others and we don't overburden the hospital system. So recently here in Costa Mesa, there was a lot of discussion about plans for the Fairview Development Center. The federal government wanted to move a, a number of patients from the initial wave of infected people um, to this facility. And um, there was a significant um, resistance to that proposal from the local community and from local political leaders. Uh, but I would argue here that actually um, a facility like the Fairview Development Center is actually important. And let me explain why. Currently, it's an unused state-run hospital that was used for people with developmental disabilities. It has about 114 acres with 400 beds, so it's in a relatively spacious um, uh, setting. It consists of small dorm and residential units, and importantly, it includes nursing, staff, uh, nursing and staff support stations. So as a consequence, a facility like this can segregate infected individuals from the community at large, which is necessary for the quarantine and medical care, but still keep them close enough in our communities that makes it convenient and easy for families to stay connected and reduce everybody's stress levels. Uh, it also enables the segregation of those patients with mild and moderate cases and keep them out of the general hospital patient pool where they could be a risk for other patients. And it allows for a separate pool of medical staff to ensure that we have continuity in staffing levels but staff can also potentially become infected. So as a whole, community participation uh, is vital to, for crisis management going forward. It's important that, uh, in my opinion, in the future here, every community needs a facility like the Fairview Developmental Center. Uh, we need it in our backyard. So it's not NIMBY, but YIMBY. Um, in absence of uh, something like this, we may expect that caring for patients will occur in things like metal trailers that are located on um, state property, for instance, trailers on the OC fairgrounds, or you might expect a larger assembly of infected patients being housed in cots in school gyms. Neither of these are ideal. What's more um, uh, helpful, in my opinion, is to have a facility like the uh, Fairview Developmental Center, which is an unused state hospital, um, refurbished and, and converted to be able to house the surgeon patients that we might expect in the future weeks and months going forward. So with that, uh, I'd like to leave you, and if you have any specific questions or comments, uh, please visit the website. Thank you.